Amen. So we come to our text uh, of sermon this morning. I pray that or ask that you turn to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. As I mentioned uh, at our opening, we will uh, plan to spend four uh, sermons in Psalm 139 this morning and this evening, and then, Lord willing, next Sunday morning and Sunday evening. And the text this morning is the first six verses, though in order to frame uh, the entirety of the psalm, I would like to read all 24 verses. We'll ask for the Lord's illumination and then consider the first six together. Again, this is the authoritative and the inerrant word of God. Let us give it our full attention. For the choir director, a psalm of David, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God, how vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do not I hate those who hate you, O Lord, and do not I loathe loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. Let's ask the Lord to give us understanding as we look into his word. Our God, we do pray that you would teach us now with wisdom from above, not with the wisdom of men, but with the wisdom taught by your Holy Spirit who searches even the deep things of God. May he, may he through the word, bring out the riches of Holy Scripture and seal them to our hearts, that we would receive these words with faith, that we would be rebuked and consoled, and built up in our faith by your Spirit. Lord, we are not sufficient for these things, and so we ask now that you would illumine us as to the meaning and the significance of your holy word. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Among all created things, man occupies a unique and a dominant position. We know from Scripture that this is due from the fact that we are created of all the visible things in God's image. One of the features of God's image that sets us apart from other creatures is our knowledge of ourselves, that we are uniquely self-conscious, self-conscious in a way that isn't merely uh, due to sense knowledge. My dog may know that something is hot or cold or tastes good or does not taste good, but my dog is not able to reflect on herself as a subject. And though I may say bad dog, she seems never to take it to heart. Because taking it to heart is actually something that only an intelligent, not just a sensible, but an intelligent creature can do. That we can analyze ourselves, that we can know ourselves, that we can reflect upon ourselves with a kind of moral judgment. That we can know ourselves, which is not an easy thing. We're equipped to do it, but it's not an easy thing to know ourselves. But of all creatures, we can know ourselves. Other creatures are able to do amazing things. Beavers can build dams that last for multiple generations, perhaps longer than the house I live in. Bees can create an almost perfectly symmetrical system of comb in a hive. Creatures are endowed with amazing gifts of self-preservation, but man, humans of all of them, are endowed 
with the, with the ability of self-knowledge. In self-knowledge and awareness, man is unlike and superior to all of these other creatures. An old philosopher once made the observation that even if the universe of matter combined to crush man, man would still be more noble because he would be conscious that he was dying, while the material universe would not be aware of its success or its advantage or of its implications. Even in that moment, we ourselves would excel the created world around us. To know ourselves sets us off from all other creatures. That being said, we should hasten to emphasize that we are not the only ones that know ourselves, that we aren't simply known to ourselves, but that we are also known to our maker. And in fact, self-knowledge has become increasingly difficult for mankind after the entrance of sin. Sin clouds our minds. Sin makes us strangers to ourselves. Sin alienates us from ourselves so that we can fail to know ourselves rightly and as we ought. We tend to miss important facts about ourselves, and we tend not to register our habits, our thoughts, our intentions. In fact, think of how often the excuse, I didn't mean to, is offered as an excuse for an action in which meaning to was precisely what you should have been doing. We are fail failures at being intentional and at knowing ourselves and directing ourselves. Near the end of our psalm, and the part of the reason I read the entirety for us, is that the psalmist ends the psalm with a, with a request, and it's an interesting request in light of the words we'll consider this morning, but consider first his final petition, which is, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any hurtful or way of pain in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. That the psalmist, as it were, lays himself before the Lord and says, examine me and be thorough. Search me and don't just know my physical condition, but know my heart's condition. Now, in a very real respect, God doesn't wait for our invitation to know us. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. He fills heaven and earth. The things that we think in secret are, as we read in, in uh, Hebrews already, open and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. But the psalmist is, in a certain sense, adding his amen to the reality. He's not giving God permission to search him. God knows you. God knows your sins. God knows your hurts. God knows your pains. God knows the sincerity of your faith. God knows you. And what David says is, and I would have it so. That's how the psalm ends. So that to frame the beginning, search me, know me, try me, and then lead me in the way everlasting. Use all this knowledge to bring me to glory. We might ask the question, what's the purpose of the knowledge? We'll consider this particularly in the first six verses. Is the purpose here primarily to console or to convict? Um, it has both effects. As we consider God's perfect knowledge of us this morning, we'll see that this can be a very convicting doctrine, that all things are open and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do can feel rather invasive. And it makes us perhaps uncomfortable in the presence of such a holy God who knows us so perfectly. And yet, I submit that the psalmist is speaking these words to console us, to give us encouragement, to know that while others may not know you, and you may not know yourself so well, that God knows and with that knowledge cares perfectly for you. As we open up the text together, I want to just outline it uh, with four observations, and I'll use these as a guidelines uh, this morning. First, that God knows the things about us that only we know, that God knows those things about us that only we know. Secondly, that God knows us infinitely better than we know ourselves. Thirdly, that God's knowledge preserves us, verse 5, and then finally in verse 6, we'll consider that God's knowledge inspires our wonder and our admiration. Rather than driving us from his presence to hide from him, it, in fact, brings us into his presence with a spirit of worship if we respond correctly. First, let's consider this, that God knows the things about us that only we know. Though, as I've mentioned, human knowledge uh, and awareness was damaged in the fall, there's still a special self-knowledge that each one of us has. There is a sense, even after the fall, in which, of all humans, you know yourself best, and you know yourself most. We need only think, perhaps, of the 
faculty of memory in which we can remember events, and I don't just mean secret events or ones that would bring us to shame, but all sorts of events that are part of our store of memories and no one else has access to certain of those memories, that we can recall our lives and we can recall events in our lives, that there's a sense in which the narrative of our life is something that we remember. Now, perhaps as time goes by, the narrative becomes more porous and we start to forget whole years. Uh, what happened in 2017? That's not very long ago, five years. I have to actually look at, I keep my calendar so that I can help myself remember, but there's still a sense in which I know more about my life that year than perhaps anyone else does. More than this, we also have still been and still retain the faculty of conscience, which is really simply the faculty of knowledge now with regard to moral judgment. And conscience can convict us and condemn us, but conscience can also exonerate us, that I can say my conscience is clean, even if others accuse me and put my head on my pillow, is a special kind of self-knowledge. In fact, I think we shouldn't minimize this. To have a clear conscience may not get you away from your accusers, but it will give you peace with your God. There's a special kind of self-knowledge that is given to us in a clean conscience. Likewise, a defiled conscience um, may be hampered, but it's not silent. In John Bunyan's allegory, the Holy War, most of us perhaps know his wonderful allegory, The Pilgrim's Progress, uh, which is really a, a, a classic in Christian literature, but less known is his allegory, The Holy War, in which there is a, a battle for the city of man's soul. He doesn't, his allegories are not too difficult to understand. Uh, and the gates of the city of man's soul are the senses of man, and through the senses of man come in all sorts of wicked infiltrators, and when the wicked infiltrators, through the lust of the flesh and through pride and through the lust of the eyes, you think particularly Eve looking on the, on the fruit and it was pleasant to look at, when these infiltrators come into the city of man's soul and they overthrow the government, so to speak, and they set up a wicked king in the very heart of man, we're told that one of the citizens of the city of man's soul that was cast into a deep dungeon was Mr. Conscience. Again, everything's just kind of there on the surface with Bunyan. And they sought to bind their own conscience so the conscience couldn't speak against them as they gave themselves to wickedness. And Bunyan, in his very vivid way, describes that sometimes in the city of man's soul, even after the fall, late at night, the voice of Mr. Conscience would come, as it were, howling out of the dungeon into which he'd been cast, and it would, in a kind of eerie way, echo down the back alleys of man's soul. Sold in sin, lying in the lap of the evil one, walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, who's at work in them, the sons of disobedience, and yet conscience cries out against them. There's a special privileged knowledge that God mercifully places in the soul of man and keeps there. We know ourselves through conscience in a moral sense, for good or ill. We know ourselves in, a, in perhaps a, a, a more amoral sense just by memory, that we have a, a knowledge of ourselves, and yet we have a knowledge of ourselves that is privileged, that is uniquely accessible to ourselves. Now, we may allow others in. Others can get to know us by observing our behavior, listening to our words, having conversations with us, and these are all the means by which we get to know each other. But even there, we can have conversations and we can pick words to mislead others. We know ourselves in a way that others do not. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 makes this point, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? that we know ourselves in a unique way. And knowing one another is, for us, a very difficult thing. Proverbs 25, verse 3 says, As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. Unsearchable. And yet Proverbs 21, just a few chapters earlier, says that the heart of a king is like water in the hands of the Lord, and he turns it whichever which way he pleases. Simply to say, unsearchable to whom? Unsearchable to whom? Unsearchable maybe to the king's counselors. They don't ever know exactly what he's thinking. Perhaps unsearchable to his wives or unsearchable to his children or to his subjects. The heart of a king is strategic and keeps secrets and maybe may have great and amazing thoughts or terrible thoughts, such as it were, 
that aren't accessible to others. Known to ourselves uniquely, yes. But on that note, we're faced with the first words of this psalm, verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. Uh, New American Standard adds the me in there. Really, it's more open-ended. You have searched me and known. And there's a kind of, there's a kind of open-endedness of that. You've searched me and known. Known what? Whatever there was to know. There's a kind of, when the Lord searches, he doesn't come up short. When the Lord, when the Lord penetrates and investigates our lives and our hearts, He doesn't reach a limit of his knowledge. He searches us thoroughly and through to the end. You've searched me and you've known. It's an interesting opening line given the prayer at the end. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. But the psalm actually begins with him saying, God has already done so. In other words, it's not a question of God waiting, knocking at the door of your heart, wanting to get to know you, but somehow not able to get inside. That's how we are with each other. That's how we are with each other. That's fine. We're creatures. We're limited. Um... That's a knowledge, we share knowledge with each other, but we don't, and we certain, in a certain sense have to permit others to get to know us. But we don't permit God to know us. He has searched and he is known. And it's not about this or that. He has searched and he has known everything, all of it. The details then follow uh, right after this. There's not one area of the human life that is not dealt with in the first four verses. Uh, in verse 3, for instance, he says, you scrutinize my path, uh, verse, uh, verse 2a, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. Verse 3, you scrutinize my path and my lying down, and they're intimately acquainted with all my ways. Uh, but it's not just simply the empirically observable stuff. I mean, I could, I could know you're sitting and you're rising and you're going and you're coming if I just spent time with you. In fact, the, the companions in our lives know these things about us. Uh, and so it doesn't seem like it's an impressive thing he's saying here. The holy angels know these things about you as well. In fact, so does the devil and the demons that are around watching you. There are, uh, there are many who know your path. They know when you sit, they know when you rise, they know when you come and when you return. Many know these things. Humans know these things and j- angels and fallen angels are aware of these things. But then he says, verse 2, you understand my thought from afar. And verse 3, are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Verse 4, he says, before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. This is a level of knowledge that penetrates beyond the empirical. This isn't something that an angel or a fellow human could know about you, but this is something deep in your heart that could be hidden from your fellow creatures, but is not hidden from God. He knows our ways. He knows our thoughts. He knows our hearts. He has searched and he has known. His knowledge of us goes everywhere in us that conscience goes. If you shudder at a secret sin or blush to think of it, one that perhaps no other human on this earth knows, God knows. There's not something that we hide from him. By the same token, on a positive note, if you are upright, even if others don't think that you are, but you truly are, then we know that God supports those. Second Corinthians chapter 16, or Second Chronicles, sorry, 16:9 says that the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the whole earth that he may strongly support those whose hearts are completely his. That's what it says. That there's a scrutinizing, but the scrutinizing is not simply to scrutinize in order to stand in judgment. He also scrutinizes in a certain sense in order to build up and to preserve and to care for his people. He knows you perfectly, not simply to diagnose your sin, but he knows your heart. Even when your heart is righteous, he knows your heart. We should, that, there's a sense in which while this convicts, it should also console us that if our heart is truly righteous and humble before him by his grace, then he knows that. He knows that as well. The one with a good conscience welcomes this knowledge. When your conscience is clean and your conscience is right, it's good to know that God knows too, even if those around you doubt. Even if those around you doubt. You can be upright, and that is known to your God. David considers this examination, and he says, God knows everything about me, that I know. My goings, my comings, my sitting, my speaking, the thoughts in my heart, 
this certainly goes beyond my fellow creatures. But in coming to the second place, it's more than that. He says, that God, he says, in effect, that God knows us infinitely better than we know ourselves. It's not just that God knows as much about you that you know, but in fact, God knows you better than you know yourself. Consider this as our second point, that God's knowledge goes quite beyond the measure of your self-knowledge, because as we already mentioned, there's a sense in which we can be strangers to ourselves. I mean, this is e you can easily see this when it comes to questions of physiology, right? You have some kind of ailment, and you go to a physician, and the physician diagnoses it, and you didn't even know you had such a body part. <laughs> and now it's disease, or it's the source of your trouble. All your life, you've had this little piece of your body that was functioning by God's design, and you had no idea that it was there and what it was doing for you until there's trouble. Your physician might know your, I'm thinking of this especially because this week I have scheduled my annual physical exam, so it's on my brain. What's he going to find? He has the blood test. I don't know the results. He's probably going to tell me too much bad cholesterol. That's okay. Um, I can work on that. I don't know what else he's going to tell me or what else he's going to find, but I know this. I'm paying him because I think he knows more about my body than I do. I paid someone to draw my blood because I think that, a that someone with the right technical knowledge will understand what my blood tells about my condition better than I could. I mean, when I bleed, I don't look at my blood and say, oh, wow, I didn't know that was there. I don't see anything. I send it to a specialist who has better knowledge of me than I do. We sometimes do this. Sometimes we seek the knowledge that others have of us that is more profound than our own knowledge of ourselves. Sometimes That's true of our bodies. That can also be true of our souls. There's a certain sense in which while it's true that another, no one knows you as well as you know yourself, this doesn't mean that there aren't times and situations in which others know us better than we know ourselves, right? For anyone who is caught in a trespass, we're told by Paul, let those who are spiritual among you go to him and recall him. Sometimes when you're caught in a trespass, you're blind to yourself. You're lost to yourself. You don't realize that you're in a course of self-destruction and someone intervenes because they can see what's going on in your heart in a way that you cannot. That's finite knowledge. It's a blessing to us to have physicians. It's a blessing to us to have counselors who address our body and soul, those aspects of ourselves of which we might be unaware. But God, God's knowledge penetrates to the very deepest core of our being. Verse 1 still accommodates itself to our knowledge by saying that God searches us and knows us. Now, it's not that God moves from a position of ignorance to knowledge. We want to be careful to not say that God doesn't know, and then he sets out to investigate, and then after a course of investigation, God makes a discovery, and he puts it all together and gives you a diagnosis of your body or soul. This isn't how God knows. Nothing is hidden from his sight. God doesn't search because God is ignorant. That's how investigators work. There's a, there's a mystery to be solved, and you try to gather up the data and the clues and make an assessment of the situation. God isn't working bit by bit in time, gathering bits of data, putting them together and coming up with a solution because God isn't in time and God doesn't move from ignorance to knowledge. So why does he say you've searched me? I think he's using ordinary human language to say, just like one who makes a thorough investigation knows the matter, so God, like that one, knows the matter. It's using the language of searching to say our God has this kind of penetrating knowledge, as if he has pried into the very secrets of our being like a searcher might do. Jeremiah 17.9 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Then it asks rhetorically, Who can understand it? Indeed, who? And the answer is... Um, Man himself is often deluded about himself, but there is one who does. You have searched me and known my heart may be desperately sick. Who can understand it? This psalm says God does. God does. He understands it. Now, if we look at the, some of the things he lists here in the first four verses, uh, some of them don't seem particularly spectacular. That God knows when you sit down and when you rise up, that he scrutinizes your path and your lying down. Let's just look at those. That, there's a certain sense in which this is pretty accessible information. In fact, 
you could know these things about yourself. God could know them about you. Another human could know them about you. And they don't seem like they're very hard to know. I mean, I know about you right now. You're sitting down. I see it in front of me. You know my standing up. You see me standing up in front of you. God knows that. And you think to yourself, big deal. <laughs> Why does it matter that he knows these very ordinary things? But, but then he doesn't know them in an ordinary way. Think of this. Let's just talk about sitting down, rising up for a moment. Um, do you know your own sitting down and rising up? Well, you know it in the moment. You know that now you are sitting and that you were standing a moment ago. But, like, let's dial back the clock just for this morning. Do you know how many times today you have sat down or stood up? I'll say that I can't. Maybe some of you do. You got up just before church. You knew when you stood up. You sat in the car. You got out of the car. You sat down here. Fine. How about the last 24 hours? Or the last week? And you might think to yourself, am I supposed to know these things? When I sit down and when I rise up, that's, the, that's just the ordinary stuff of life, sitting, rising. I don't know how many, I, don't, I couldn't tell you in the last 24 hours exactly how many times I've stood up or sat down or exactly where or for how long. Moreover, I don't feel any sense of obligation to know that about myself. That would just be tedious in the extreme, it seems. I, I, have, a, you know, it's like a, I have a real life. <laughs> I, I have to, I have other things of greater importance than when I stand and when I sit and where I go and for how long I stay there, and I can't hold all of that together. In fact, scientists say one of the great parts of of our memory is the ability to flush out so much superfluous information. Most of what you know, you forget. Most of what you know, and I don't just mean big scientific things, I mean like little things that you know in the moment. You You know that you are sitting here now, but you will forget this. You will forget this because there's a certain sense in which you, a man of little capacity, Mill made Pooh Bear say that he was a bear of little brain. We have finite capacities. There's just so much that we can know, even about ourselves. And yet, I think this is the point. And yet, it's not tedious for him. It's not tedious for God. That God knows the things about you that you don't even give a second thought to. That God knows the cares and the concerns and the ordinary things that you don't have the capacity to retain in your own minds. God knows. I don't think he's saying God knows tedious things. I think what he's saying is God knows and attends to the things about yourself to which you don't even give a second thought. Not to say you should give a second thought to them, but you can simply say, I leave to my Lord to order and provide because my life and all the mundane little parts of it are in his hands and perfectly known to him. Even our ordinary self, in a certain sense, is a stranger to us. He adds to that something more in verse 3, if you look at the first line there. He says, you scrutinize my path and my lying down. The scrutiny there is interesting. It's not merely observational knowledge. Literally, the word is winnow. It's a strange way to describe knowledge. You winnow my path and my lying down. Well, to winnow is to, is to sift out. And when you winnow wheat, or you winnow the chaff out of the wheat, you beat the wheat And then the winnowing process is when you blow on the wheat so as to separate the chaff from the wheat. And what he's saying, scrutiny is probably a good translation of it, but winnow is the word he uses. When you winnow, you separate out. This is what God's doing with your life. He's not just observing it. He's measuring it. Wood, hay, and stubble. Gold and silver and precious metal. The things about your life that are enduring and the things that are fleeting the things that have weight, and the things that are weightless and hollow. That's what he knows about you. We're told in the New Testament that we will give an account for every vain word we speak. The winnower knows. You think, well, who can, give me, who can hold me on the record for every word that I speak? The one who knows every word that we speak. He sifts our words. He sifts our path. He sifts our lying down, and he sees whether we are, and he he knows whether we are doing it faithfully or unfaithfully. I think here it's not just the fact of lying down; it's the manner of it. 
when I lie myself down to sleep, do I entrust myself to the Lord, my soul to keep? And when I arise in the morning, am I with him? And is he the first thought on my mind? Do I end my day with him? Do I begin my day with him? Do I sit down to a meal and receive it from his hand? And when I am full, do I thank him? This is the sifting of our lives. Ordinary stuff, right? Going, coming, lying down, sleeping, getting up, eating, drinking. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, that's pretty ordinary stuff, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God, and God sifts you. Do you eat and drink well? Do you eat and drink to the glory of God? The ordinary, do you come and go and lie down well? He's not talking about posture and table manners per se. He's talking about heart. Does my heart receive these things from the Lord? John Gill, commenting on this text, says this, Uprising may respect either rising from bed, when the Lord knows whether the heart is still with him, what sense is had of the divine protection and sustenation, and what thankfulness there is for the mercies of the night past, and whether the voice of prayer and praise is directed to him in the morning, as it should, Psalm 3, 5, or else rising from the table, when the Lord knows whether a man's table has been his snare gluttony or ingratitude, and with what thankfulness he rises from it for the favors he has received. He knows whether you eat and drink to his glory, whether you receive all these things as from his hand, or whether you have a sense of deserving and entitlement. He knows whether you live unto him or unto self. This is the sifting. This is the knowledge. He knows the course of our thinking. He comprehends our entire thought process. He knows how every thought and act in our lives will interrelate. The complex nexus of man's mind is perfectly understood by God. He's not merely dealing with so many disjointed parts of our lives. He understands how the whole holds together. He knows exactly what thoughts and words and actions in our lives, what they mean and what they indicate about our whole condition. Psalm 11, 4, we began with this, or we read this earlier in our scripture reading. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in the heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. All things are open and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Do we prosper well? Uh, do we suffer well? Can we live you know, Paul says that he has learned in whatever condition he is in, Philippians 4, whether abounding or doing without to be content. That we are anxious. Does he, he knows our hearts. Try me. See if there's any anxious way in me. He knows whether there is an unholy anxiety in our hearts or whether we are with prayer and supplication making all our requests known to him in faithfulness and gratitude. He knows whether that's the disposition of our heart. He knows these things perfectly. Pushing that one just a, tip, a little bit further, verse 4. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Jesus says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that really it's what's in the heart that informs the sound <laughs> that comes out of our mouths. And he says, before I speak, the, I can know a little bit about you by listening to your language, listening to your conversation. You can know about me by listening to my conversation. And even on the innocent things, you can know my likes and my dislikes. If you listen to my conversation around a table, you'll know whether I like this or that food or don't like it. You'll know the motives, the thoughts, the intentions, even in the odd, moral, indifferent things of our lives. But you'll also know whether we are, sometimes, perhaps you've met people, and it doesn't take you very long to know that this is a bad person just by the way that they speak, or to know even in the way that they speak that this is a person who's near to God. It just is apparent in, the, in, their, con, in their manner and the content of their conversation. But to really know the person would be not merely to know the words, but to know the heart from which the words proceed. And he says, before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. What he, he's not simply saying, you know, how a spouse might sometimes say, I knew you were going to say that, <laughs> right? A good friend might be that way. You always say, I knew you were going to say that. So that's how, after a while, in married life especially, there are little phrases that are familiar, responses in certain circumstances. You kind of, you know what the response is, and you know how it's going to be expressed, and, you know, good or bad, but you might say, I knew you were going to say that. Is that what it is? God just has the, a friendly familiarity. He kind of knows how you respond. He says, before you, before you speak it, he knows it all. It's not simply because he's familiar with you. It's because from the heart, the mouth speaks, and the heart is laid open and bare before him. He tries us. 
He sifts us. He knows us. When we confess our known faults, He knows all the faults we don't even know to confess. Search me. Know me. See if there be any anxious way in me. He says in Psalm 19, acquit me of hidden faults. (laughs) Know and search me and deal with the sins that I'm not even aware of. God knows us better than we know ourselves. Thirdly, and more briefly, God's knowledge preserves us. If we look at verse 5, he says, now he comes off of this and he speaks of God's providence here for a moment. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. That this knowledge that God has of us, interestingly, doesn't drive him away. The knowledge is not knowledge that sort of puts God to flight. But with this perfect knowledge of all the cares and concerns, good and evil, of your heart, that God, with that perfect knowledge, draws near in providential power. His hand is behind, before, and above. He encloses us on all sides. The one who knows us best is also the one who hems us in behind and before. I think for the believer, this is the encouragement. God knows my anxious thoughts. God knows my heart. He knows my righteous dispositions, but he also knows the secret sins of my heart. And yet for all this, with loving care, he provides for me. That this knowledge does not put God to flight, but with this knowledge, he draws near to deal with us. We might even see this as God's hand providing for us because he and his perfect knowledge of us sees our neediness. He sees that we are wanderers in the wilderness. And so he puts a pillar of fire before and a cloud behind to hem us in, to protect us, to guide us, to bring us to his heavenly habitation. In Exodus 14, verse 19, we read this. The angel of God, who had been going before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. Here's a people recently delivered from bondage in Egypt, but not yet in the holy habitation of Canaan, wanderers upon the earth, as it will, pilgrims on their way to a holy habitation, but not home yet. And he says, in this pilgrimage, where they are very needy, they need water, they need food, they need protection from enemies hostile to their well-being who are in pursuit of them. And he says that he is the one who goes behind them and before them and hems them in, in the middle of their difficulty. There's a sweet assurance in knowing that we're surrounded by the one who loves us and who knows us best. In fact, I want to put these two together and say, if God took care of us but didn't know us well, then we could question whether his care would be perfectly suited to the need of the moment. I could care about you, but I may not know you. And if I don't know you, then how meaningful that I care about you may mean something to you. But God's knowledge, God's knowledge, both of the wicked ways in our hearts and of our needs and even of our good deeds, that this knowledge is the knowledge by which he acts on our behalf. Even, and this one perhaps is the challenging thing, even knowing, even knowing the, the wickedness and the faithlessness and the doubts of our heart, even knowing this is a benediction to us that God knows us perfectly and with that knowledge places his hedge of protection around us and above us. Matthew Henry speaks of this knowledge, this laying on of the hand, almost like the knowledge that a physician has of his patient. Wherever we are, we are under the eye and hand of God. Perhaps it is an allusion to the physician's laying his hand upon his patient to feel how his pulse beats or what temper he is in. God knows us, as we know not, uh, God knows us as we know not only what we see, but what we feel and have our hands upon. All his saints are in his hands. Like that physician who, on Thursday, he's going to put his stethoscope on me and he's going to tell me to breathe out. And he's going to place it in about six or eight different locations. And he's, he's getting near me with his knowledge to see what may ail me or to give me a clean bill of health. But with this knowledge, he draws near. He's going to test my reflexes, I'm sure. I've got to get ready for the little mallet to hit my cartilage below my knee. Um, there's There's a care. This is a knowledge that isn't simply far off, but it's a knowledge that is near at hand to provide for us. 
While there's comfort to the believer, this reality of God enclosing us, placing his hand behind, before, and above, terrifies the unbeliever. He thinks that, as all unbelievers think, that this is the presence from which he would like to flee. We'll see this this evening in the second section of the psalm. Uh, Where can I go from your presence? He thinks that this knowledge is too invasive, and it's true. It's true. The knowledge of God explodes the myth of privacy. I'm for private property, and I'm for privacy when it comes to fellow humans. I don't think I enjoy so much privacy when it comes to holy angels. I certainly don't enjoy that kind of privacy when it comes to my God. The question is whether you think that this is an invasion of your privacy or whether you, like with the psalmist at the end, say, search me, O God. Whether you add your amen to this, that's the question. It's not a question of whether God searches us and knows us. It's a question of whether we say, have at it. Try me, know me, sift me, lead me heal me. Bring me to your presence. That's the question. Some translate this, you have environed me. Acts 17, 28 says, for in him we live and move and have our being. We are not strangers to God, even if we may be to ourselves. Finally then, by way of response to this, the psalmist almost stops for a moment. In verse 6, there's a, there's a doxology that breaks out. Now, in verse 7, he's going to come back to his contemplation, but there's this doxology that breaks out, and he's, he's stunned at this knowledge, and he's not stunned at this knowledge because he understands it. He's stunned at this knowledge because he can't understand it. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. He marvels at it. He wonders at it. The God with perfect knowledge of not just my ways, but also my heart, not just of my words, but of the motives that underlie them. God, with perfect knowledge of me, nevertheless hems me in behind, before, and above, and is, as even as Jacob said at the end of his life, that God has been his shepherd all his days. (laughs) The psalmist looks at this and says, this is too much. I can't attain to it. He's not saying he doesn't believe it. He's not saying that he doesn't know it, but he also is saying that he doesn't know it. I understand that God understands me, but I don't understand the understanding of God, that there's a profundity in God's knowledge and in God's care that exceeds my capacity to comprehend. And rather than despair, David ponders this great mystery of God's perfect knowledge of him, and rather than despair, he breaks forth in praise. This statement, it's too wonderful for me, it's too high, I cannot attain to it, is not, a pro, is not a statement of disappointment. It's a statement of joy. We should rejoice in knowing that our God knows us more perfectly than we or anyone else could know us because with this perfect knowledge, he knows perfectly how to protect us and preserve us and lead us home. Most especially, most especially, he manifests this perfect wisdom, which to the world is foolishness in the sending forth of his son. He has, his eyelids have tested the sons of men, and they have been found wanting. We have been found wanting. We have come up short. He has searched us and known and tried our hearts, and it is not pretty. And yet with this perfect knowledge, he sends forth a redeemer who is perfectly suited to answer what ails us. We were born dead in our trespasses and sins. He in his body carries our sins to the cross and bears our punishment in our place. He, we are far from God, wandering in darkness. He goes into the darkness of the tomb and on the third day rises from the dead and opens up the path to life and glory and habitation with God through his resurrection and his ascension. And God says, for everyone whose heart has searched and found wanting, which is all of us, Flee to him, and you will find the remedy for what ails you. God's perfect knowledge of our sin goes hand in glove with his perfect provision to cure us from our sin and to bring us home. A God who knows us, and only a God who knows us so perfectly, is equipped to deal with us so perfectly as our sin requires. We respond in wonder and admiration. Indeed, The mystery of the gospel is marvelous in our eyes, that the love of God outreaches our comprehension, that we believe it and we know it, and yet we marvel and do not comprehend such a knowledge and such a love. 
It's my desire this morning, each of us, myself included, flee to this provision that he has made. The one who knows us perfectly is the one who's made a perfect provision for our sins in his son. For those of you that are hoping in his son, be encouraged. For those of you that are trusting Christ, not those of you that are sinless and don't have any hurtful way in you, those of you that have cast yourself upon God and his perfect knowledge, his perfect wisdom, and his perfect gospel, for you, be encouraged. Be encouraged that he knows us perfectly and has made the perfect provision for us in Christ Jesus, that the perfection lies with him who loves us. Let's pray and prepare to come now to the Lord's table to remember this great sacrifice.